So um, there's quite a bit of public land. I remember in the production group when Ken Rich was saying, none of this means anything unless there's any land. So um, um, it, uh, with affection, with, with affection. And he was right. He was right. We can't produce anything without the dirt. So um, we're going to walk you through some things that we know, thanks to MTC, who's done a study. Um, Therese Trevetti, where are you in the back, is directing a study that's um, going in deep to work on that hard stuff of the inventory of where is this land, who owns it, how much is there, and so on. So to give you a snapshot of that, um, and there'll be lots more to share on this at the end of this month or this summer when the results, the, the final draft, is done. Um, the transit agencies, cities and state, and other special districts have quite a bit of land. It amounts to what could become 30 to 50,000 homes. So we're talking about this not in the, all the little bitty parcels that may, might be right up to a greenfield. We're talking about the juicy parcels that really could be um, housing in a very practical way. So um, leading that is a transit agency, BART, and um, other transit agencies like VTA. BART and VTA have, by the way, done some really cutting edge policy work to get their house in order, um, to know what to expect of their land in terms of market rate and affordable housing. So um, they're really doing that work, um, which is um, innovative for our region and the whole country. Abby, you want to add to that at all? I really innovate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next slide. There are 700 acres, approximately 700 acres all throughout the region. I wish I could show you a map and just kind of take you on one of those tours to see that it is very dispersed, generally speaking, throughout the region. Um, and... Uh, and really can achieve a high level um, of capacity. So we're talking about 470 acres, almost um, 700, I'm sorry, uh, 470 parcels, almost 700 acres with that really large capacity. So how could we possibly get there? Heather, is if, suitable for land, is that, that doesn't necessarily mean zoned, or for housing, sorry. Trees. Or, yes. It doesn't, it does not necessarily mean zoned for housing, but it is near transit. Or great. Therese, why don't you just sit at the table with the microphone so we can make sure we get you recorded and just join us for the conversation. Thanks. Do you want to just repeat that into the microphone? Yes, so the study looked at within a half mile of transit uh, parcels that were suitable for housing and after looking, you know, taking away like rights of way, in environmental contamination, various other layers, it really landed on what is vacant or surface parking lots for most of the region. And then in San Francisco, we also looked at what was underutilized. So, you know, you know, smaller sites that could be or that have something on them, but that could be redeveloped easily. Just to jump in on that, I know like I got a call from a guy at VTA saying we have a ton of land, all of it's zoned office. Can't you please rezone our land, somebody, so we can build housing on it? And there, in another production committee, there was a rezone non-housing land for housing that included institutional land. This is exactly what that was intended to solve, are these large swaths of land that are not zoned for housing that are publicly owned and could be made into housing if they could get the proper zoning. There's a series of challenges, um, regardless of the agency or the city, and Abby's gonna walk us through some of that. Sure, so uh, we, we had a great in-depth discussion about what all the many challenges and strategies were in our group, and the very last page of the packet is kind of the, the working document that we used. Um, and yes, Denise, we we have land that is literally not zoned. So <laughs> um, it's, it's even worse than that. It's not zoned for anything. Um, so this is a really high 
boiled down version of the many, many challenges we discussed. And, and one is that I think there is definitely some growing cons consensus, particularly in the um, housing advocacy community, that this is public land and it is a public good. We heard that this morning, public land for public good. But I think that there are many different interpretations of what a public good would be. And I can speak you know, on behalf of just Bart's perspective on this as the biggest public landowner um, in Teresa's study. Um, that you know we are at capacity in one direction, so we would like to see office space in the East Bay to have butts and seats on our trains that are going to the East Bay. We are looking to do office development on some of our properties. We are certainly looking to do mostly residential development, um, and we're looking to diversify our own revenue base as a transit agency. You know, with you know over 70% of our operating budget is paid for by our riders, and as we lose riders, we aren't able to sustain ourselves. So. We understand the, the public land, public good, and the desire to see high levels of for affordable housing on property. I think I'm, I'm just speaking as one agency, but we heard it from other others. We heard it from cities who, who are looking maybe to, to grow their own revenue base or who have their own goals. And so there definitely was a lot of disagreement and very um, hearty discourse in our group about, um, about how we prioritize what uses go on public property, and it's, it's not so easy. Um, uh, we've already discussed zoning constraints. I will note that, that, that um, MTC's study was assuming a density of 50 units to the acre. Um, we have projects coming in at 115, 135 units to the acre that are three, four-story buildings. So um, we thought we could be more aggressive and maybe up the ante to maybe produce 50,000 units on public land. But yes, that would require some addressing all the issues that we just discussed in terms of local pushback and, and all of that. These are just some serious tensions that we need to work through. Um, there's definitely a lot of misunderstanding and lack of clarity uh, within the Surplus Land Act, and I just want to go back to this slide here that's showing 118 acres with cities and 51 with redevelopment and successor agencies scattered across, what, 88 jurisdictions now? If you count the counties, I guess, maybe 90 jurisdictions or so. And so that's a lot of enforcement to do of the Surplus Land Act, which does require a right of first refusal for um, some level of affordable housing. So um, it is very, very hard, and, and you know, public advocates and other organizations go and try to chase down these agencies and try to, try to uphold the law, but the law is also quite vague. And so we had a lot of discussion. There was an there was there amendment bill, do you remember? It's in the packet. Um, I'm not as good with Michael on the bill numbers. <laughs> um, but there was an amendment bill to try to clarify you know, the definitions of surplus land and what would qualify and what, what would be um, really required. Um, and, 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 but at the end of the day, who's also going to enforce this? And it comes down to nonprofits and advocacy groups that are doing the enforcement of a state law right now. And so I think that's just a really important thing to note. Just to say that was, uh, not that it matters anymore because it died, but that was AB 2065 Ting. It was our bill. Uh, ran, it ran into many challenges to try and get clarifications, which is why I think the law isn't more clear up front. We'll continue to work on getting those clarifications in the law. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then the next one is lack of technical ability to do the deals. So, you know, BART, we have a staff of about 10 people that work on our joint development projects. They're incredibly complicated. They are so, Adi can tell you, <laughs> they are so, so hard. Um, but we have the capacity, but we are the biggest landowner in the region, and VTA has the capacity, but VTA is the second biggest landowner in the region. But what about our school districts and some of our cities who are sitting on one property? They just simply don't know what it takes to do disposition and, um, and to, to be staffing up to get an FTE to lead that just doesn't make financial sense. So there needs to be some way to support these other um, public agencies who's so, who, do, who don't see a primary responsibility to be developing housing on their property to do more. Um, and then in terms of the eligibility of these properties for low-income housing tax credits or ASIC or other programs, it's really variable and really spotty in terms of whether they're going to be able to compete for funds or not. And so this is something I think we really want to discuss is if this is our low-hanging fruit, if land is a problem for affordable housing developers, and we have land and we're willing to do a deal on the land, but it can't compete if, you know, for 9% tax credits or for ASIC, is that a disconnect? Is that something that we need to resolve? Um, and then the last piece is data. So 
Um, those of us who have gone through the effort of collecting information on public land, and this includes BART within our own real estate and property development department, which is responsible for records keeping, it is really hard to pin down exactly what is available. Um, and it is so such fragmented ownership and, and, and the, the pain and suffering that MTC and its consultants have had to go through to find out what's near transit is just, is just unreal. Um, but at the same time, knowing, knowing what our low-hanging fruit is is just so critical. I mean, we, we actually could make a, make a little dent in this, in this um, problem we have, but we have to know what, what our total supply is and how to strategically deploy it. And um, so to that end, um, MTC has delivered us with this amazing resource that we'll be able to use very soon, which is like a web-based inventory of the public land they've identified near transit. Um, and how competitive it is for low-income housing tax credits in ASIC at the moment. So we just pulled this example of Union City. Um, but, you know, it is, we're using, you know, the assessor's data to identify this. Um, I'm not even sure. In fact, I, can, I, I would put money on the idea, on the fact that public agencies, some public agencies probably don't know what they own. <laughs> I think it's fair to say some public agencies don't know what they own. And so we really need to just address this very basic fundamental problem that we don't, we don't know what we don't know about this property. And we've done this. We have 700 acres. This is just next to transit. So what about the bigger PDAs? Or what about just, just generally? What is it that we're working with here? So um, I think the importance of this, even though it seems like sort of a silly thing, cannot go understated, that we have to be able to just pin down what we have. We have to be able to track it. We have to be able to know when it's being disposed of and be able to monitor that and, and really think more strategically. So we're gonna very quickly talk about some of the solutions, but if you would like more detail in addition to a conversation, on pages 30, uh, 53 to 55 in your packets, there's quite a bit more uh, meat on the bones of these three things, four things coming up. Um, one is to use the process of a housing element for cities for them to identify where their public land is. It's a perfect moment in time for them to say, this is what it is, in addition to where they think affordable housing could go. Um, that goes to the state. And then the second is to have a nice, strong, big stick. Um, and that means um, revisiting the Surplus Land Act and doing that cleanup work so it's clear. Most city attorneys are, well, all city attorneys are smart. Most city attorneys will tell, tell you that there are about five to six different interpretations right now to the Surplus Land Act, and that provides a lot of wiggle room for um, not really having a, a clear next step with them for what to do next. So um, it's doing that cleanup work, trying again. And the last is creating those carrots. Um, MTC could do it, maybe the state could do it, um, incentivizing that housing on public land, and especially incentivizing the affordable housing on public land. Um, and that would help cities and other transit agencies and, and school districts and others um, get, uh, figure out, be incentivized to figure out what to do in order to create this housing. Get off the dime. Um, so you want to talk about the... The other one, the regional one? Uh, yeah, so um, our second proposal to you today is uh, fitting with the notion of a regional housing entity, which has come up a number of times in discussion, of really addressing some of these issues and on, on running the full spectrum from technical assistance to land banking. and um, But just the notion that somebody should be out there, um, you know, doing the work of, you know, if we, if, if, if we agree with that 16.1 is a good idea and we have all these housing elements reporting on what public land is out there, a regional entity could consolidate that information and start to think strategically about land disposition at a regional scale and where are our priorities. So as, we're, uh, as developers are applying for funding, you know, that, that could be taken into consideration the same way MTC does for transportation projects to some degree. Um, Technical assistance to those many, many scattered fragmented agencies that don't have staff dedicated to land disposition or joint development. Also technical assistance to really explore um, state, state and municipal codes around um, public facilities that maybe could be a joint use. Like perhaps there are some regulatory barriers to doing a joint use on a property where you put housing over 
something else. In this case, uh, on the previous picture, we had housing over a fire station in DC. This is housing over a library in St. Paul. So, but, but can we legally do this? I think we need someone to be digging into that. Um, I think providing funding, I, we know that we need a facilities master plan. We need to know what we could kind of rejigger in order to free up our, our land. I'm sure that's true for a lot of school districts and community colleges where they, they could just start thinking more intelligently about how they're using land and what they're gonna need over the next 40 years. Um, so they're not just sitting and kind of just sitting on it because you know, we might need it in you know, 2100 or something. Um, and then ultimately, um, possibly banking or coordinating use. So I think there's a full spectrum we could pursue. I think we could start small and go bigger, but I think just the idea that we should be playing, you know, playing a regional role in this issue.